guys, let's get going, shall we? I appreciate your time. I know that it's three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. I know that we all have webinar fatigue. I know that, yeah, it's, uh, it's been an interesting couple of weeks for all of us. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for being here and thank you for making the commitment. I hope that I will offer you value in the next hour. I hope that I will give you something to think about. And what I, what I know for sure is that you will leave with a lot of practical tips. This is going to be a very practical and um, hands-on and outcome-based session. So please feel free to make any notes that you, that you like. I will make the slides available via email afterwards. So I will send you a PDF of all of my slides. Um, so the only things you need to write down are, are the things that I might say that are not on the slides. I will be jumping in and out of um, shared screen and video so that you can see me for some of it and, and see my slides for some of it. And uh, the only other things you need to know are the following. We have Daniel who is managing tech for us in the chat. So if you get stuck or have questions or whatever, need help, can't hear me, etc., uh, please chat to Daniel Janks. He's there in the in the in the chat. Um, there will be no recording of this webinar. Um, I have decided not to make a recording available, just because I am doing it for free, and um, I just you know appreciate the fact that people are here live and have made the commitment and shown up. So I do want to reward those of you who are here. Um, if you do get bounced out for whatever reason and then can't get back in, I am streaming this session live on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. So all you have to do is go to YouTube and search for Tiffany Markman and you'll see there's a picture of me and this will be live streamed there if you get bounced out for any reason and can't get back in. Um, the Q&A will happen at the end. So please do keep your questions going. Uh, Daniel will record the questions that, that are, you know, that you make obvious are questions in the chat. If I see them and it's relevant to what I'm discussing at the time, I might um, tackle one or two of them live. Other than that, I'll be available for as long as you need at the end to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and with that, I think we should begin. So you're all muted. Uh, the reason for that is dogs and hardy dars and children. I am not muted, so you will hear dogs and hardy dars and possibly children. Um, but do keep your videos on if you don't mind. It really helps the speaker to be able to read her audience's faces. And I love seeing you when you smile and nod and shake your head in horror and all of that good stuff. So please do keep video on if bandwidth allows. Feel free to greet each other in the chat. Uh, feel free to say where you're from. I know that's a thing that speakers now like to encourage you to do, say where you're from. Most of you are probably from South Africa. So if you're from somewhere exciting like Richards Bay or Nelspreet, um, I'm just kidding. Um, you are welcome to tell us where you're from. I quite like Richards Bay and Nelspreet. I also like Bloom. Okay, I'm going to begin. Here's what I believe about social media and small business. I believe that landing consistent work and especially now is not actually about being the best at what you do. It's about people knowing that you're the best at what you do. So it's not enough to be good and it's not enough to do it well. You need a persona. And if you don't have one yet, you need to leverage the power of social media to help you to develop one. Now, I know a lot of small business owners and um, freelancers and consultants are not wild about social media. A lot of people find it scary, intimidating. The fact that there are so many platforms means that we often don't know which ones are a good investment for us, where to spend our time, what to invest in. Um, and so, what I'd like to encourage you to do is pick the ones that work. And I'm gonna help you to decide which are the ones that work for you and which are the ones that are worth using as touch points based on where your customers are. The whole point of this is to find them where they are and to invest your time there. Everything else is just a nice to have. Okay, so the reason we wanna create a persona on social media and the reason social media is good at that is we want people to think of us first. We want when people think 
grammar, we want them to think of me, right? When people think um, freelance webinars, we want them to think of me. And whatever your thing is, we want people to think of you. We don't want to use social media to push, to hard sell, to constantly funnel out tons and tons and tons of sales copy. That's not what social media is for. Why is that? Because people don't go to social media to be sold to. They go there for all sorts of other things. And we're going to look at those platform by platform. So let's go and do that right now. Okay. So for those who don't know me all that well, I'm a copywriter by profession, uh, specializing in corporate and business to business work. I'm also a trainer, a small business owner, and a big nerd. Uh, the reason that's important is because one of the social media platforms that works beautifully for creating like-minded communities is Facebook. And I find Facebook a very inspiring place to create little communities of different nerds. So if you have a quirk to your personality and it's something that overlaps beautifully with the niche that you work in and the service you provide, then Facebook tends to be a very good place to create like-minded communities. Now we are living in a weird world, okay? Uh, this is most of us at the moment, scared, tired, cold, uncertain. And the problem is that where we could previously engage like this, face-to-face, -face, building rapport, establishing eye-to-eye -eye contact, shaking hands, now we have to engage largely like this. And that creates a weird distance between us and our, our prospects. It creates a weird sense of, um, you know, sales via correspondence. It can be a bit awkward. And I think that social media is one way in which you can show your humanity and your authenticity um, if you are careful about the way that you use it. So remember that as a freelancer, as a consultant, really any kind of self-employed person at any time, but particularly now, the goal is survival, right? And so what I'm going to try and help you to do over the next hour is use social media to generate more income. Um, now, I can't say to you that doing X or Y will yield X amount of money. It doesn't work like that. But what tends to happen is that social media allows you to build a kind of credibility that does increase leads. And I'll give you some real numbers about the differences in leads and inquiries that I've seen from different platforms when I started taking them seriously. So we're going to really be looking now at putting your network to work, taking the network that you already have, growing it, and then attracting more people to your brand so that you are top of mind when the need arises. Let's begin. The very first tip that I have for you is about length. When, when moving from print or even from web to social media, there's a massive change that we have to make to the way we think about length. And that change is that any print document, like a brochure, for example, or in the old days, a piece of direct mail that you might then want to put on a website, you would automatically cut it by half. Okay, so let me go through that again. The conversion from print to a web format means that you have to shave half of the text. So if you took a brochure, put it on your website, you would need to cut 50% off. If you then took that very same piece of text and converted it to a social media platform, you would need to shave 75% off. In other words, you would need a quarter of what you had originally when moving from print to digital to social. So the length requirements on social are very, very different to what people will tolerate if they're reading a magazine. And the reason for this is that 79% of your viewers are scanning and only 16% are reading every word. Okay, this is, this is a digital reading statistic and it comes from Morks and Nielsen who are just the gods of digital user behavior. Um, I've put the URL there if any of you are interested in digging up some more of their research, these guys are amazing. And they've told us that basically four out of five people reading your stuff are not reading all of it. They're scanning. And not even one in five is reading every word. And none of us can really make a living out of 16% of our market. A lot of people ask me, what about the other 5%? They don't read anything. So they don't deserve to be on my slide. And online, you have 15 seconds. 
to give your audience what it's looking for. Okay, otherwise they'll leave. That's three clicks. So you really can't afford to faff around with setting the scene and preparing the ground and hiding your punchline at the bottom. Your audience isn't gonna to get to the bottom. Tip number two, and these apply across all social media platforms, is about content. You need to forget your agenda. It's not about you. You actually have to flip the switch in your mind between what you wanna tell the audience and what they need to know. I'm gonna say that again. Typically when we go onto social media for the first time or when we're not comfortable or confident using social media, what we do is we tell our audience every conceivable thing they could possibly want to know about our business, our brand, our product, our service. Those are features and your audience doesn't care. They wanna know what's in it for them. They wanna know how you, your service, your product, et cetera, can solve their problem. Um, so you need to flip the switch in your mind between your agenda and their agenda. You have to operate from their perspective, not from your perspective. And give them content, relentlessly give them content that solves their problems. This is a very, very different way to use content because it's about focusing on value, not on sales. Okay. So why this is so useful is that when you strive to create trust, the best way to do that is by giving your audience value. They get used to the fact that you supply them with free insights all the time. And then when they need you, you're top of mind. Now, what is the magic formula for this? It's 80-20. How does this work in practice? For those of you who came to this webinar because you saw me on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, you'll know that maybe two out of every 10 posts that I share are sales, but eight out of 10 are tips, advice, how to do this, why you should do that, a different way to think about X, um, here's what an expert says about Y, whatever it might be. So my rule is 80% of the time I'm sharing my IP for free out of my head. And 20% of the time I might be selling or promoting a course or writing services or LinkedIn work. But 80% of the time I'm teaching because I believe that the biggest part of sales is serving. And I'd rather give my audience free value all the time. And then when they need me, they know where to find me because I tweeted this morning, for example. So when you go onto social media, you need to be quite strict with yourself and make sure that you are providing 80% value, 20% sales. Remember what I said right at the beginning, no one goes onto social media to be sold to, they go there for all sorts of other things. So still on the content front, people say to me, okay, so 80% of it must be value. How, where, how do I know, where do I start? Well, you start with a couple of questions. What does your business or brand actually do? Okay, how does it talk? What does it talk about? What does it want to talk about? And then crucially, does it have any events during the year that are particularly important? So if, for example, you run an accounting practice, budget time, tax time, and year end are crucial for you. If you have um, a law firm, then they're gonna be, there's going to be World IP Day. There's going to be Copyright Day. If you are a copywriter, for example, there are going to be all sorts of interesting things happening around the Copyright Amendment Bill. Um, so these are the events or milestones during the year that you can use when crafting your content calendar. It goes beyond women's focus text in August for Women's Month and um, you know, youth focused stuff in, in June. You've got to really dig a bit in order to find seasonal content that's meaningful and relevant. So you have two choices. You can use calendar content. In other words, you go with what's happening in the world at that particular time. Or you can go with topical content. And this is guerrilla content. This is tactical and responsive. And you've got to be very, very quick about this. And this is in response to things that are happening in the world, right? So if you have calendar, you're going to pre-plan it quite flexibly. Um, I, I would usually advise planning six months content ahead. You don't have to write all of it, but it is a good idea to get a sense of what you're going to say based on when your major milestones are. And then topical content, because it arises as things happen in the world and you don't foresee that, the reason you need to be flexible is to allow for that when it happens. 
So just a quick difference between calendar and topical content. Calendar content is usually planned weekly or monthly. It's usually themed, it's strategy-based, and it's under your control. But topical content is responsive, which means that it's tactical. And because it's based on relevant events, it can be slightly more risky. In other words, you may go onto social media and post about something that in retrospect, maybe you shouldn't have. Um, and here I'm gonna give you a little tip that is not in the slides. So this is something you may wanna write down. Do not put anything on social media that you wouldn't want the following five people to see. Your parents, the police, a pedophile, a priest, or a potential client. So it's the five Ps of people you don't ever want to see your content on social media. Priest, pedophile, police, your parents, potential client. If one of those five would feel awkward about your content, rather don't do it. Other than that, feel free to take a couple of chances. I've developed a very quirky, irreverent, weird, even aggressive persona on social media, because that's me. Uh, I'm pushy, I've got a loud mouth, I can't, uh, I can't dial that back and I don't really want to. So it's okay to be yourself um, and don't be so cautious that you land up never saying anything. If you are gonna source content like I do very often from credible sources um, and share that with your audience, where can you look? Here are a couple of options. I'll quickly go through them, but you will get the slides afterwards. Established business websites like Forbes and uh, Harvard Business Review, mainstream news like Business Day, quality industry associations or institutions. There are a lot of these. I follow the Pointer Institute, Safria, um, the Content Marketing Institute. You could go to trustworthy portals like the Huffington Post if you think it's trustworthy. I kind of do sometimes. Reputable local and global writers. So if you're a copywriter like me, Ed Gandia has great stuff. Nick Osborne has great stuff. Um, Marie Folio has good stuff. And I find a lot of good stuff on well-moderated blogging platforms and Medium is one example of those. So you can find beautiful, credible content. Here's another tip that is not in the slides. You may want to write this down. I sign up for something called Google Alerts um, for specific phrases that are relevant to what I do. So for example, every time an article appears on Google um, that has the key phrase, build a freelance business in it, I get an email to say, woohoo, look here, here's something someone wrote somewhere in the world that has the phrase build a freelance business in it. And all you have to do to do that is go to Google Alerts, just Google Google Alerts, and set up your alerts. And then it'll send the traffic to you, which makes life easy and fantastic. So there's a little tip and it's free. Tip number three. So if you remember, tip number one was length. Tip number two was content. Tip number three is platform. Choose your platform strategically. Remember I said right at the beginning, some of you may have missed that that where you invest your time and energy depends on where your customers are sitting. We want to go to touch points where we can find them. So now we're going to break it down. We're going to break it down into the individual platforms themselves. If you want to encourage communities to form, right? So if you, like me, are a big old nerd and you want to encourage a community of nerds to form, on social media, that's what Facebook is for. There's the magical Facebook. It is wonderful at encouraging communities to form. Here's what works on Facebook. So guys, this is the magic slide. There's five of these. This is the first one. If you know how to do a screenshot, now's the time to do a screenshot. Although again, you will get this in PDF form. Here's what works best on Facebook, according to Jay Bear, who's a nerd like me. Link posts perform best, followed by images and then by text. What is a link post? A link post is a link to an article that either you wrote or someone else wrote. So it's got a URL in it, right? These are the posts that perform best on Facebook by a lot. Followed by image posts with a caption and then by text only posts. So if you're deciding what to post on Facebook, Facebook people like links, then images, then text with no images. Now, Facebook's great because there isn't really a limit on length. Okay, you can go quite long in a Facebook post without getting cut off. But Jay Bear has researched the number of characters or letters that produce the best engagement. And that magical number is 111. Please don't ask me how he did this. Um, he did a lot of research, which I'll talk about in a minute. But 111 characters produce the best posts. 119 are good, 40 are okay. So 
aim between 40 and 119 with 111 as your goal and you'll be fine. Now let's talk about hashtags on Facebook. Facebook does support hashtags, but it doesn't love them and neither do Facebook users. So the optimal posts on Facebook have no hashtags in them. This isn't a problem unless you are syndicating content across different platforms using one aggregator. So what do I mean? If you use um, a, a platform like Hootsuite or TweetDeck or the one I use, which is Sprout Social, um, then you can set your post to go to a whole lot of different platforms at once. And obviously you do want hashtags for Twitter and Instagram. So the Facebook ones are just gonna have hashtags in them because it's come from an aggregator. But if you're creating your content manually for each platform, keep in mind that Facebook doesn't love hashtags. Emojis, a maximum of one, but only if it's appropriate given the content. So a maximum of one emoji for optimal engagement on Facebook. And this again comes from Jay Bear. And if you want more stats from him, he's a genius, go to convinceandconvert.com. Put the URL there for you. So just in case you're wondering who the hell Jay Bear is, he's a huge nerd like me. And he analyzed 6,399,322 individual social media messages and conducted 11 studies to get some of the data that I'm sharing with you now. So he's uber, uber smart and we believe him. Number two. So we spoke about encouraging communities to form and we choose Facebook for that. Number two, when your goal is to build business to business credibility. In other words, when you provide corporate orientated services, LinkedIn is where the magic happens. And before I jump into what works, let me tell you a little story about LinkedIn. So until recently, I, not even that recently, until about two years ago, I invested almost no time and energy in LinkedIn. I thought that it was a waste of my time. I thought that it was a place for people to try and sell me financial services, timeshare, multi-level marketing schemes, pyramid schemes. I really didn't believe that there was any value to be had on LinkedIn. And so I invested no time or energy or insight in LinkedIn. And then about two years ago, I realized that if I was going to be teaching social media and people were going to continually ask me about LinkedIn, it was a bit embarrassing to admit that I didn't use it. So I thought, all right, what I'll do is I'll syndicate my Facebook content to LinkedIn automatically. So I don't actually have to go there ever, but I can just send my Facebook page content to LinkedIn and see what happens. And in a short time, I realized that if I was going to do that, then I may as well make sure my profile looks nice and and engage a bit there and dig around and see what interest, interesting groups there were and maybe give a few people recommendations. And very, very, very slowly over time, I started to invest in LinkedIn. And then one day I woke up and I realized that the bulk of what I do is either corporate copywriting, in other words, I write about companies, or corporate training, in other words, I teach people in companies. And LinkedIn is a business to business platform. So why the hell am I not going to my customer where they are? And that's when I started taking LinkedIn seriously and creating custom content for LinkedIn and engaging there and being there and talking there and connecting with people and um, really putting time and energy in. And I can't tell you the difference it made within maybe a month of investing as much time in LinkedIn as I was investing in Facebook. I started getting an average of five inquiries a week. Now, these are incoming, not, uh, not cold calling. This is people calling me. Um, and I can see what happens when I ease my foot off the accelerator of LinkedIn and I stop investing, my email, my, my email inquiries don't come in as rapidly. Um, but when I do invest, they come because I'm a business to business copywriter. So if you're not currently spending time on LinkedIn, but you're in B2B or corporate services, make that change because it's worth it. Um, LinkedIn is a magical platform because it's the one place where people spend quality business time. They're, they're not looking at videos of pandas or cats sneezing or what are the, some of the other rabbit holes I've gone down lately? Sloths having a bath or watching John Oliver videos from three years ago. They're on LinkedIn for business. So they're there to do business with you. They're waiting. Go get them. Um, I just want to check that you're all good where you are. So I want to just jump into the chat quickly and see that everyone is okay. Right. No crises that I can see. 
Uh, feel free to tank your video if it's causing you bandwidth trouble, um, as long as you can see me, that's what's important. And as long as you can see the slides, that is even more important. Okay. Right, so we are now gonna jump to what works on LinkedIn. Link posts perform best on LinkedIn, obviously, because that's what it's for. So the link posts, as I said previously, are posts that have a URL. You can link either to your own content or to someone else's. Text posts are the next most engaging on LinkedIn and then image posts. So text, then images. Now, if you're gonna put an image anywhere, it needs a caption. That's really, really critical. Um, 149 characters are optimal on LinkedIn. So that's the magic number of letters that a LinkedIn post should contain. Then 125, then 95. LinkedIn does allow for hashtags. In fact, LinkedIn will push you when you're creating a post to put hashtags at the bottom, but actually zero hashtag posts get the most engagement on LinkedIn and zero emoji posts perform best on LinkedIn. So save your emojis for Instagram or Twitter or WhatsApp or you know wherever, but LinkedIn doesn't love them. So you can do without them there. Right, so if you remember, we've spoken about Facebook, which is where we encourage communities to form. LinkedIn, where we try and build business to business credibility. And now what if you wanna engage with individuals? What if you're in a B2C environment or a retail environment? Sadly for you, Twitter is where you need to be. A couple of years ago, well, not a couple of years ago now, 12 years ago, November, 2008, almost 12 years ago, I joined Twitter. So I've been on it for a more of a long time. And in the old days, it was lacquer because we were all nerds and you could really find a community there of fellow nerds. Most of us were in digital marketing or content or copywriting or some kind of creative industry. There was a lot of ad agencies back in the day. And really there were great conversations to be had there. Now, Twitter seems to be largely a repository of whining and politics. But if you are in retail or B2C, you may need to seriously consider Twitter as a platform for your brand. Here's what works on Twitter if you're gonna do that. Image posts perform best on Twitter. They stand out because the Twitter fall is so frequent and moves so quickly. Followed by text only and then by link. Here's a little tippy that isn't in the slides. Where do you think the link should go in, in your tweet? So I'm going to, I'm actually going to jump out now. I'm going to stop my screen share. I'm going to jump back into Zoom and I'm going to go into the chat and I'm going to ask to, for you to guess where the link should go in a tweet. Where is the optimal place to put a link in a tweet for best engagement? Where do you think that should that should be? Come on. There are 86 of you. <laughs> Taryn, you cheat. Okay, where in the tweet should it go? I'll give you three options. Beginning, middle, or end? Beginning, middle, or end? Where should the link go in a tweet? Overwhelmingly beginning. Okay, middle. Some saying end, some saying middle. Okay, it's going too quickly for me to, to, to announce the, the, the majority rule. Taryn, you are sneaky. Taryn, who works with me, knows exactly where they go. Uh, she said not at the beginning, which is true. So actually, guys, where your link goes, the optimal place to put your link in a tweet is in the middle. So what your user wants to see, <laughs> Andrea Orlin, nowhere, use an image. Yes, but remember <laughs> that on Twitter, your users like links. Okay, so how you're going to structure it is you're going to put the intro to your tweet, just a couple of words or a phrase or your opinion at the beginning of the tweet. You're going to put the link in the middle and then you're going to put your hashtags at the end. So the optimal place to put a link in a tweet where you have very little space is in the middle, not at the end. Most of us are lazy and we put it at the end, including me, but it's in the middle. Okay, so that was fun. I've seen some of your faces now. Oh, look at all these lovely smiley people. A lot of names that I recognize. Some of you I've taught before. Some of you have been clients. Some of you are from high school. How's it? I've gone fat. Um, okay, let's uh, go back to my keynote, shall we? Right. So, what works best on Twitter? Image posts first, followed by text, then by link. 100 characters. Oh, except... 
you can put a lot more than 100 characters into a tweet before it'll cut you off. However, for optimal engagement, for the tweets that produce the best results, 100 characters, including the link. So keep it short. 113 are good, 93 are okay. The magic number is 100 letters. Two hashtags are optimal for top tweets, two hashtags, and only one emoji, if appropriate, given the content and or the topic. These stats don't come from Jay Bear because he doesn't do Twitter. They come from Buddy Media and Track Social. Again, stunning reservoirs of content in there. If you Google them, you'll find some lots of amazing stats. Now, if you want to educate and enlighten your audience, if you are a coach, a consultant, a trainer, a teacher, um, someone who produces content that is practical and education orientated, LinkedIn is where the magic will happen for you. This is the best place to put tutorials and little videos and Google loves it and it will optimize the hell out of your website if you have links to lots of YouTube videos that feature you. So here's what works on YouTube. 5,000 characters fit into the video description box. That's quite a lot, 5,000 letters, but only 157 of those appear above the show more button. So you can only see 157 of those before you have to click show more. So you need to front load your video description text with good stuff, right? You've got to put the good words in the beginning. And I find in my own experience, this, these stats come from me, that a tight 200 word synopsis works best on YouTube. As long as Google has 500 characters for SEO, for search engine optimization. So let me go through this again, because there's a lot of numbers in this one. You can fit 5,000 characters in before you'll get cut off. Only 157 appear above the show more button. So you need to put the good stuff in there. I find that a tight 200 word synopsis performs best as long as there's another 300 words underneath there for Google, so 500 in total, because Google leverages uh, YouTube text for SEO purposes. Finally, one more social media platform that I'm gonna talk about is actually the one I use the least. And it's the one you need to use if your goal is to impress and inspire, and that is Instagram. Let's quickly talk about Instagram. So one of my students asked me the other day, which of the five platforms she should invest her most time in. And I, you know, turned the question on her first and said, well, which one do you think you should spend the most time on? Um, and she said, well, I definitely have to include Instagram. If Nicola, if you're on this video, I'm talking about you. Um, she said, I definitely have to use Instagram. And I said, why? And she said, because everyone uses it. And I said to her, but do your clients use it? Are your clients on Instagram looking for someone like you? Now, she specializes in marketing strategy. No, no one's looking for marketing strategy on Instagram. They're looking for shoes and food and boobs and lipstick and, you know, cute pandas sneezing. I don't know. We're on Instagram because we've got nothing better to do. We're not on Instagram looking for marketing strategy. And she said, yeah, you're totally right. My clients are on LinkedIn. Of course they are because she offers a business to business solution. So if you are in fashion or food or retail, photography, illustration, design, decor, um, or, or even if you're not in any of those things, but you produce a lot of content that is visually sexy, then use Instagram. But for me, my market is looking for writing or training and neither of those things translate all that well visually. <laughs> I can't draw a straight line. So Instagram is where I spend the least of my energy and effort because my people are not there. Right, what works on Instagram? Images, ups, work the best, then live video, then Instagram TV and then Insta stories. So images first, then live video, then Instagram TV, then Insta stories. The optimal number of hashtags is not 400 or even 30, it's 11. Okay, 11 hashtags is the optimal number for Instagram. I hate writing hashtags, so I usually write two or three, but 11 is the, is the optimal number. The perfect caption is less than 10 words and more than 20 emojis. Or I hate emojis, um, except the vomit one, obviously. Um, and heart eyes is the most popular Insta emoji if you want engagement, the heart eyes one. Guys, I don't know why, but there it is. Social Insider will back me up. These are the numbers you need. Gesundheit to you with your 11 hashtags and your 20 emojis. 
Um, but you know, do what works. And also, may I suggest that if you're going to use these techniques from now, what you should do is just make a note of the techniques that you're going to start using, write them down with the date, and then in a month, go back and see how your engagement has changed so that you can tell whether it's working and if you need to change anything. There's no point changing the way you do things and then not measuring and not knowing if it's worked or not. So at the end of this webinar, maybe make yourself a little reminder for a month's time to go in and reevaluate what your analytics are showing you based on changes you may have made after this. So we spoke about tip number one, which was length. Tip number two, which was content. Tip number three was choose the right platform. And tip number four is structure. You got to tell a story on social media, a very short one, because out in the real world, no one has to read your stuff. The trick is persuading them. Storytelling is good for that. Why is storytelling so good for that? Because you can cut through rational barriers using many stories, including stories low as resistance to persuasion techniques. I was talking about this with another student yesterday, Taryn S. If you are there, I'm talking about you. Um, including stories in your copy lowers resistance to persuasion techniques. So it makes people forget they're being sold to. Stories are beautiful. If you're going to create a sense of micro story in your social media posts, they need to be, they need to have uneven movement. In other words, they must have differing momentum and velocity. They can't just be one level. Okay. It can't all be shouting. So what I mean by this is you can't post on social media and every single post be, oh, so excited, it's amazing, woohoo, yay, exclamation marks, emojis, because that's shouting. And if you do that all the time, your user won't be able to differentiate between that and the rest. Um, at the same time, it can't all be unicorns and roses because then your audience feels that it's too sweet and too much and too sentimental. You really need to make it about people. And remember that, People have moods, and so your copy should also have moods. Um, emotion matters. Emotion and, and emotive content work, um, provided that once you've made people feel something or you've made them feel miserable, you take them up again at the end. That's why stories are called narrative arcs. So if you, if you follow the, the flow of a narrative arc, it either starts down and then goes up, reaches a climax and then brings your audience down again gently, or it starts up, goes down and ends on an up. Um, but it's not a flat line. That's why it's called an arc. So you can't only post shouty, shouty, enthusiastic posts, and you can't only post happy, happy, jolly, hashtag blessed posts. You do need an uneven momentum in your posts to create variety. It's like writing sentences that are the same length all the time. They're flat. You've got to have a couple of short ones, a couple of long ones. There's got to be sentence length variety. So that was about getting attention using stories, the story structure. Now we're looking at style. Loosen the hell up. And really, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It doesn't matter how formal uh, or business-like your industry is. You need to write your social media content as you speak, not as you write. So what you'll probably acknowledge is that you have different writing and speaking voices. You've got one voice that you use that comes out your mouth when you talk to someone on the phone. And then as soon as you sit down to write an email, this weird other voice comes out that sounds like your English teacher from high school or a lawyer. Um, and you use all these heretofores and aforementions and forthwiths, and it just sounds too terrible. Please don't do that on social or anywhere, but particularly on social, loosen up. Aim for text that is casual, that is friendly, engaging, simple, and plain. Why? Because social media content exists within the first square meter of people's personal space, right? It's, it's in their pocket. It's in their face. It's on their tablet. It's on their laptop. It's, it's in their lives. It's direct. You're not putting it on a piece of paper, signing it, folding it, putting it in an envelope, putting a stamp on, putting it in the post box. You're in their face. You're in their ear. So you can afford to sound like a human speaking to other humans. Casual, friendly, engaging, simple, and plain. Now, I'm not saying you need to use slang necessarily if that doesn't match your brand voice, but I am saying that you should be using your own natural speaking rhythms and word choices when writing for social media, it should sound like you sound. How do we do that? Well, write as you speak. 
don't use adverbs. Adverbs are describing words or qualifiers that end in L-Y. Don't use them ever, but particularly on social media. And please watch for adjectives. They can be very squeaky and cheerful. Use lots of you and your, not so much we and I. You and your, because it's second person, it's a second person pronoun, really engages your audience and makes them listen. Um, it creates a lot of cl closeness, whereas um, third person, they and it creates distance and we and I is very egocentric speech. So try and use you and your. Short words and sentences, but also remember that you do want variety. So the default should be quite short, but you can mix it up a bit. And what I mean by short words, I mean, choose the simplest word always. So if you have a choice between utilize and use, use the word use. And please watch for weird punctuation, like the overuse of exclamation marks. You only need one and even then probably not. Um, and again, emojis with caution. So a couple of things to keep in mind on social. The first is register. In other words, the level of formality. You can afford to drop that uh, a fair bit because social media is such a direct medium. So communicate as you would speak. The second is rapport. It's critical in order to create engagement that people feel that they're talking to a person or engaging with a person or hearing from a person or reading the insights of a person. Repetition. It's totally okay to reuse posts because not everyone will see everything and people are online at different times of the day. I'll talk about this a bit more in a minute and a strong call to action. So let's just go through each of these. Register or formality, relentlessly human. Forget pretty, don't agonize over your wording. It's not poetry. Talk to them in the language they use every day. Humor, you can use it, but only if you're actually funny. So my husband will tell you that I'm not funny um, and so I very seldom use humor on social media. I do use irony, but I don't, I don't try and be funny because I'm not really funny. I'm ironic. Um, so if you're really funny, use it, but use it with care. Don't be afraid, though. If you're going to be so afraid that you don't ever post anything anywhere, then rather take a chance and apologize afterwards. I'm a huge fan of saying sorry afterwards rather than asking for permission before. Repetition, totally okay on social media. You can reuse your high value posts. In other words, if you know that a post uh, or an article or a picture has done extremely well for you and got you a lot of engagement, use it again. Um, I in fact schedule my posts to appear more than once. So they'll usually appear for the first time at eight or nine o'clock in the morning, depending on the platform. Um, my two big ones are Facebook and LinkedIn. So most of my posts go straight there eight, nine o'clock, eight or nine thirty, even in the morning. And then what I'll do is I'll schedule that exact same post to go out again about a month later uh, or two weeks later at 2 a.m. in the morning, because then I can, you know, appeal to markets elsewhere in the world. Um, but also it means that people aren't always seeing everything. And a call to action is so important for the two sales posts that you do out of the 10. Remember I said eight of them must be value adding, two of them must be call to action based. If you're going to use a call to action, ask yourself very clearly first, what do I want them to feel, think or do? Do I want them to be impressed with me, my brand, my services? Do I want them to feel inspired by my story, my pictures, my video? Do I want them to believe in me or what I can do or my products or services? Or do I want them to buy? Or do you just want them to like? And that is all I have for you. So having now spoken nonstop for, what's that, 45 minutes, I'm going to stop my share. I'm going to jump back into your screens. There I am. And I am going to ask, is Daniel making inappropriate jokes? <laughs> Yes, he is. I'm going to ask you to um, ask me questions. So yeah, it's quarter to four. Um, that was actually quicker than I thought. So I'm going to stay on for as long as you guys have questions. Pop them into the chat. Um, Daniel has been listing them for me. So I'm going to go and look for them. Dan, you said there was one right at the beginning, which I can't find. So whoever you are, if you put the first question up right at the beginning of the day, please repost it for me so that I can see it. Right, the rest of you. Uh, Re-character limit. 
Does the 111 include, include spaces or not? How do we get maximum benefit out of 11 hashtags? So the 111 was, uh, was that, which platform was I talking about? I can't remember, was that Facebook or Twitter? Um, it would include spaces, yes. Maximum benefit out of 11 hashtags. Okay, let me talk about hashtags. So the, yes, the 111 does include spaces. Maximum benefit out of 11 hashtags. If you're gonna use 11 hashtags, that's the Instagram rule. Um, my advice would be anything that is a proper noun, your name, if you're speaking about a country, uh, if you're referring to a, a, a company name, a brand name, those should be the first and most important hashtags. Then stop to think about what people might search for. So let's say, for example, you own a shoe factory and you're posting stuff on your sneakers. Your hashtags would need to be strongly related to SA sneakers, local sneakers, um, shoe manufacturing, Tiffany Markman sneakers, um, high top sneakers, sneakers for girls, sneakers for boys. Like that's how you get maximum benefit by making them really relentlessly relevant. It doesn't help anyone if your hashtag is blessed or privileged or, you know, you've got to make it really specific to the thing. Um, and you can also do a bit of research on the platform to see which hashtags have the most interest and then look for the ones that have slightly less interest and go for those because you can't compete with the big ones. Okay, optimal times to do a post. Oh, yes, so I do mine um, at eight, between eight and 9.30 in the morning on Facebook and LinkedIn. Andrew, that's the answer to that question. Uh, how much time a week do I spend on developing social media? So I do social media in my dead time. In other words, any time that I'm not working <laughs> or if a client has canceled a meeting or if a virtual meeting runs late or if I'm sitting waiting for a COVID test like I did this morning in my car for an hour, that's social media time. So I use my dead time. Um, I also use probably about another hour a week on a Friday. Friday is a big day for me for, for pre-scheduling my social media content. So yeah, I'd say in total, probably about two hours a week, Craig, um, on, on social media across all the platforms, um, mostly in my daytime and then about an hour on a Friday. Also, if I have a bit of time on a Sunday night, I'll sometimes schedule some content for the following week. And I use Sprout Social, so I pre-schedule a lot of my content in advance. Linde, hello. I hope your business is going well. Can we talk about quantity over quality? Yes. Um, I would rather you post one tweet a week than five shitty tweets. One good tweet rather than five shitty tweets. Like, um, it is about quality, but it's also about adding value. And sometimes the value that's in your head that is obvious to you is not obvious to everyone else. So if you suspect that what you want to tweet has good stuff in it, or what you want to put on, then do it. You know, don't worry too much about posting too often. Um, try and get a sense of when people stop engaging. That may mean you're either doing it too little or too much. Uh, Rafil, where you mentioned aggregator. No, that isn't a, the name of a specific tool. It's a kind of tool. So an aggregator is a, a platform or portal where you put your social media content in and you can choose where to send it. So it aggregates the content for you. So the one that I use is Sprout Social, which is not cheap. It's $39 a month. Well, I don't think that's cheap. It's like 700 bucks now. Um, but there are some free ones, but um, I've never found them as intuitive as Sprout. So I stick with Sprout. There's Hootsuite. Um, there's TweetDeck for Twitter. Um, and you'll probably be able to find a few more. And also now that Facebook owns Instagram, you can aggregate across those very easily. Um, Yeah, most social media platforms have APIs that allow you to send content automatically. Kathy, you were scared to post to the whole world. Don't be scared, Kathy, just do it. The best platform for skincare products? Liel, it depends. Um, if you have lots of good before and after pictures, I would use Instagram. If it's more factual content for the moment, then I would use Facebook, probably those two. Rene, what software do you use for scheduling posts? I use Sprout, you can use anything. How do you know the best hashtags to use? Um, Instagram will tell you. So you can actually go in and see which hashtags are trending and use those. That's why you'll often see like 
a random Instagram post about clocks and then it says Black Lives Matter in it when it has nothing to do with Black Lives Matter. So that's people using the Instagram hashtag generator to see what's trending and use that. I would not advise you to just randomly post weird hashtags into your stuff. Um, but Instagram will tell you. For the other platforms, you really need very, very few. Um, so I would use very specific ones. What about language? I'm Afrikaans, but I do my posts in English. Sometimes I don't feel like me when I do it in English. Nicole, I would say you should post in both languages. I think that Afrikaans clients would absolutely love to have tweets in Afrikaans and Facebook content in Afrikaans and Instagram content in Afrikaans. So if I were you, I would have a 50-50 uh, language policy, provided, of course, that you have Afrikaans-speaking clients. Do you tag organizations in LinkedIn that you would like to target or do you need to follow their pages? Um, I don't, you can. Um, I don't, I don't tag organizations in LinkedIn. Uh, if I'm not connected with the, with the person, with the key stakeholder, um, no, I don't do that. Maybe I should do that, but that feels like a, a bit, I don't know, Marek, I don't know if that's a thing. Um, you know, you do not need to follow someone's page to tag them. You can tag anyone without necessarily being a follower and they don't have to follow you either on LinkedIn. The best platform for a travel agent or tour operator. Caroline, same answer that I gave to um, Liel about the skincare, depends on the pictures. If you've got stunning original photography and images, Instagram is great, if not Facebook. Somebody called iPhone says they're an emoji user and they should scale it back. Can I recommend any good books on social media marketing? Not books, I'm just looking at my bookshelf, not books, but a very good website is the Content Marketing Institute, CMI. There's some very, very good stuff on the CMI blog. Um, HubSpot, also amazing, amazing, amazing stuff, the latest stuff. Blogger also has good stuff. Um, I don't know about books, but those three, HubSpot, Blogger, and CMI, the Content Marketing Institute. Do I use later to post posts? I don't even know what that is. Um, sorry, Liel, no idea. If anyone knows, answer Liel. Clive, you mentioned, hello, Clive. You mentioned sending posts at 2 a.m. Won't that irritate some people? Well, no, because if they're getting my posts, they're already online, right? So you won't see my posts unless you're on Facebook. Um, and if you're on Facebook at 2 a.m., it's unlikely that I'm gonna irritate you. Um, and if you are irritated, turn off your phone. I don't know, like then have a cup of warm milk. I don't know. Um, no, Clive, I don't care. You know me, Clive. You know that I don't care about irritating people. What is the optimal number of posts per week? Liel, that is a very, very long answer because I have to answer it per platform. You should go on to convert, what's it? Convinceandconvert.com and have a look. You will find the answer there. If you can't find the answer there, email me. But uh, yeah, that is, there's a long answer. Paid for advertising on Facebook and Insta. So James, I don't do it. I don't do any paid marketing. No Google ads, no Facebook ads, no Insta ads, nothing. But um, if I were going to spend money on paid social media advertising, I would start on Facebook because the targeting is so good. The best tip I can give you, James, is do not go for the default boost post. Create an ads manager account and use ads manager. You have much more control. Um, that is what I would suggest, but I'm no expert on paid ads. I don't use them. Can I put a 149 character idea or thought on LinkedIn? Steph, I'm so chuffed to see you here. Steph is one of my former students. Can you put a 149 character idea or thought on LinkedIn? I don't know what you mean. You mean just like a random long one? I think so. I don't know, Steph, can you explain? I need more information. Best time to post, Sam, again, go look at Convince and Convert or email me. Is it effective to have a business page on Facebook? Yes, Tabitha, thank you for asking that. Thank you for asking that. Facebook has two types of thing you can have, two types of profile. Personal, which is your the one your friends and family and all that see, and pages, which is the business one. I am not talking about your personal, your, 
personal Facebook, your personal Facebook profile. I'm talking about the business one, which is called a page. In order to open up a Facebook page for your business, you need to have a personal one first, and then you make yourself the admin for your Facebook page. And that should have a different name. So it should be called Tiffany Markman Writing and Editing, for example, or Ashley Harvey Actress and Singer, or whatever. Um, you don't have to be active on your personal Facebook page in order to leverage the power of the business page. Tabita, I hope that answers your question. Facebook pages are brilliant. I love them. You do not need to be active on your personal page. In fact, I will tell you, because there are now only 76 of you left, so it's a small group, that I have a profile and a page. My profile isn't even under my real name. So it is so low profile that it doesn't even say Tiffany Markman on it. And all the people on there are either friends or people I'm related to. Literally, there are 100 friends on there. My page has a ton of people on there, and that's the one that I use for work. When posting content, should you rather not look at where your clients hang out rather than what suits you? Uh, both, obviously, right? So you need to be where your clients hang out, but also where you can profile your creative the best, Craig. So for you, I would be on... Um, I would be on Instagram and on LinkedIn. Yeah, because you're a corporate business to business service provider. It is very nice to see you, Craig. Uh, Tabita, I love Tabita. She asks so many questions. What is the best platform to promote business coaching services for SMEs? LinkedIn. <laughs> Those people that don't switch on do not disturb at night. Too bad for them, Clive. I don't care about them. What do I think of the recent Facebook boycott from brands? Yeah, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is a bit of a skellum. Um, what well, he's a bit of a skellum, and this whole the whole thing that started with um, Cambridge Analytica, and I don't know that these big, you know, Jeff Bezos also a skellum. I think when you get to a certain point, you become a skellum. So I, I kind of secretly applaud the Facebook boycott from brands. Um, but I don't know that I'm that ethical that I would boy. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd certainly like to see Mark Zuckerberg lose a lot of money and then feel guilty about the fact that he sells out to Trump lobbyists. But this is not the platform. Um, David Batsoffin, I hope to see you more on LinkedIn. Barry Cantor, how do I leverage personal Facebook? Ah, this is such a good question. So I had a student the other day, Julia. Julia, if you are here, this is your question from the other day. Julia asked me, um, Julia asked me how to convince Facebook friends from her profile to move over to her page. This is how you do that. Firstly, from today, stop accepting Facebook friend requests from your clients. That's stupid. Don't do it. Decline or ignore. And then write them a quick message that says, hi, the really good content that relates to the work that I do is on this page here. And you give them a link and you send them there. You say, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to decline this invite because this is where I talk to my family in Australia. I'm going to send you to this page. So from today, stop accepting friend requests from clients. But the people who are already there, you've got to keep inviting them to your page. You've got to keep nagging them and stop putting good content on your Facebook profile because then why would they go to your page if they can get everything you want on your profile, right? I'm, I'm yelling now. I had a client say to me the other day, um, they, they wrote... Um, a feedback form after one of my webinars and they said that I have a very hectoring tone and I do have a very hectoring tone. Sorry, I'm hectoring. Um, goodbye, Haley Joy. It was wonderful having you. My husband is so sneaky. He's posting private messages asking me who some of you are because he thinks he might have dated a couple of you. You, Peter, he thinks he dated you. Battling to post video content on Instagram, no matter what I do, I get a message saying it doesn't match their policies. Do I have any advice? Yes, Wendy, I do. If It depends what you're selling, but Instagram is fussy as hell. So if, you, if they think you are selling weight loss products, multi-level marketing, um, you've, there's certain words that will get flagged by Instagram and then they will not allow you to post. So my advice to you would be, Go onto Instagram, find the FAQ section or the help portal and dig in there to find out all of the stuff that's going to flag your content as inappropriate um, because there's something that you keep doing in the video or in the text and it's, it's, it's um, you're getting red flagged by Instagram. 
Hello, Andrea Orlin. If we have different target markets within our business because of different products, corporate biscuits on the one end, birthday parties on the other, should we focus on the different platforms or go with what will be most beneficial? There is limited time for social media. So I would definitely be on Instagram because what you do is very visual and it's easy to make stuff beautiful. Um, so Instagram for you, I think is a must. Twitter, I wouldn't bother. I don't know how much of your sales happens online, but I think that you could use your website to create a community and then potentially a Facebook page. I don't know if LinkedIn is where, I don't know if people looking for biscuits, even corporate people looking for biscuits are gonna look for them on LinkedIn. So I actually think Andy that Facebook and Instagram are your, are your magic platforms. Helene hates nagging. Helene, I need more information. What is the reason that I don't use paid for ads on social? Lizanne, I'm gonna to be totally honest with you. I don't need to. I am so um, active on social media organically that I don't need to pay for ads. I get enough work and enough inquiries and enough interest and enough leads and yeah. Uh, campaigns on LinkedIn, Mareka, I don't do it, but a lot of a lot of companies the size of yours do do it with great success. So my advice to you, Mareka, knowing which business you come from is you guys need a premium LinkedIn account and you need to be using Sales Navigator because your market is sitting on LinkedIn waiting for you. So Mareka, yes, I would say do it. Alison, what are your thoughts about going live on Facebook? I've never done it before. In fact, this is my first YouTube live, but maybe I'll try Facebook live next time. I think it's great. I mean, I've never done it, Alison, so I can't say, but I think... In principle, if that's where your market is, it's amazing. Barry Cantor, how does the number of followers you have help presence? Um, Barry, it depends on the platform. So algorithms work in such a way on Instagram, for example, that if you have 2 million followers, your stuff will appear more often. But for the rest of us who are human and not Kylie Jenner, we don't have 2 million followers. I think I have a paltry... 300 on Instagram and three and a half thousand on Facebook and about 2000 on LinkedIn. So I, I think that, um, I think that the algorithms are such that if you have massive numbers, you do get more eyes on, but even if you have small numbers and your content is quality, the algorithms like organic quality content. Do you think LinkedIn is evolving to a less I think you mean a less formal structure and we can get away with more casual content. Wendy, yes, I do, but be careful with, I don't know what you mean by casual. Um, I'm getting a lot of inappropriate sexual contact on LinkedIn. So I'm getting random assholes in my direct messages on LinkedIn saying, hello, beautiful, 300 times a week. So there's more of that and block. So yes, I think it is evolving, but I think in, in some ways it's evolving badly. Hashtag blessed, Sam. <laughs> if, you're in, if you've invited a friend to like your Facebook page before, can you invite them again? Yes, you can. I do. Not often. Like once every three or four months, I will re-invite people because they do forget. And yeah, you can. I don't think that's nagging. Lisa, Tiffany is amazing. Lisa, you are amazing. Lisa was a student of mine. Let's work this out. Probably 12 or 13 years ago. And she's still brilliant. Ah, Helene, I hate nagging people on social media. I leave if people nag me. What to do? Just start nagging. No, don't nag. Ask people once to, if, if you don't like to repeatedly request, then ask people once and then stop. You don't have to. Do, what, do what's authentic. Do what's you. You don't have to behind other people's heads forever. Joe, where do I post? A, where do I create a LinkedIn post? Ha, this is such a good question because it's not on your profile. Like you go to your LinkedIn profile to create a post that nowhere does it say create a post. You've got to be in home. So when you're in LinkedIn and you want to create a LinkedIn post, go to home. Don't be on your own profile. Daniel, stop sending me inappropriate private messages. Andy, how do I encourage people to join my business, Facebook and Instagram page? If they're not following me, they will not see the posts. Ah, you mean, how do you get more followers? So the, the boring NAF answer is good content because people see you in other people's posts. So actually that's how you get followers. People see other people commenting and then they follow you. 
Um, but yes, if you if you do want to build a community fast, paid ads is absolutely an option. Um, I wouldn't do paid ads on Instagram. Let that following um, grow organically. Maybe what you could do, Andy, is put an RSS feed, I hope that's still what they're called, on your website so that it shows your Facebook posts and your Instagram posts. And put your Facebook and Instagram links in your email signature and everywhere else you can think of. Oh, Joe found it, yay. What platform? Hello, Christian. I've watched some of your Instagram videos. Um, which platforms would you think are best for a Pilates instructor and life coach? Well, I have seen some of your videos, Chris, so I would say stick with Instagram Live. Um, I think those are working. I think that they're great. Ah, oh, there's Chris. Hi, Chris. I would stick with Instagram. Um, I would also keep doing the inspirational little text posts that you put on Instagram. Those are great. But I would also create a Facebook community of people that you could share exclusive content with. So only the people in your Facebook community get certain exclusive content. <laughs> Sam's going to see the dogs and the hardy dogs. Right. Um, guys, it is 16.07. I'm happy to hang around. If there are any more questions, I will be here if you, if you have questions. Otherwise, go and play on social media. There is no lame upsell, so I'm not going to try and sell you a course or make you buy an ebook or any of that. Um, this is the end. You can follow me if you want uh, or not. <laughs> For travel ebooks, is Insta and Facebook best? Yes, Kerry. For travel ebooks, I would definitely do definitely Insta and Facebook. Pleasure, 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 everybody. It's so nice to see some of these names. Thanks, everyone. It's been so, so lekker. Thank you for your time and attention. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I don't know if YouTube worked. I hope it did. <laughs> I guess we'll tell soon enough. Uh, but keep in touch. I'll probably be doing more of these. So, oh, Nicola, one question. What platforms are good for children's book authors? Instagram's good. Facebook's good. Oh, there's you, Nicola, nodding. Hello, in your yellow shirt. Yes, uh, Insta and Facebook. Anyone else? Thank you, Lindsay. She said the very best session she's attended. Wow, thank you. Um, I'll take it. I'll take it. What about engineering? LinkedIn, <laughs> Debbie. Debbie, LinkedIn is great for engineering because you can actually search for contacts who are in engineering rather than just randomly talking to everyone. LinkedIn actually has a, a surprisingly good search function. Um, and you can search for people based on their interests, their jobs, where they are. So yeah, Debbie, LinkedIn is where your people are. Anyone else? She finds, if Debbie finds Facebook doesn't work well, I'm not surprised. People are not on Facebook to talk about engineering. They're on Facebook to, I don't know, I don't know, post memes. Uh, Instagram works well. Yes, if you've got beautiful drawings and blueprints and engineering diagrams and um, photography, then Instagram will be another good one for you. Absolutely. Anybody else got a question? Oh, I'll just sit here and look at all of you. 30 of you left. Is a website, a website still necessary? Oh, I'm so glad she asked that. Kerry, yes, a website is still necessary depending on what you do for a living. So if like Chris, Chris the Pilates teacher, you are a Pilates teacher or a life coach, you do not need a website. You can leverage the power of a blog plus Facebook plus Insta. But if you are like me, a writer, a corporate trainer, uh, if you have a huge variety of services like Peter, I can see Peter in front of me there, uh, if you have a lot of offerings or like Andy, you sell a product online, you got to have a website. Um, so it really depends on your industry. If you can get away with not having one, don't do it. But if, if you are producing written output or creative output or selling using e-commerce, then yes, you have to have one. It is not negotiable. And if you're a, a writer like me or an editor or a translator or a, 
a, a corporate trainer or a voiceover artist or a, I don't know, what other little likemies are there? A strategist, um, a, a graphic designer, a web designer, a developer. Yes, you have to have one. Um, Marietta, is the session available anywhere for reference? Unfortunately not. Um, those of you who were here got all the good stuff. I will make the slides available in PDF form and I will send them to you via email so that you have all of the numbers and stuff. But no, this is it. There is no recorded version of this. Um, Dan wants to know if he should unmute you. Yeah, I suppose you can. There's only 29 of you left. Yeah, Dan, you can unmute them. Or guys, if you want to ask me a question using your actual voice, you can unmute yourself. Um, somebody asked me privately, um, is there training for this? Yes, you know who you are, who asked me privately, is there training for this? Yes, there is. And guess who offers some? I do. Yay. Send me an email. I will hook you up. Um, I offer a course on this. This is not an upsell webinar, but yes, I do offer social media training. So if you want it, I can help you. Anybody else? <laughs> Thumbs up, Anne. Do you love? It was lovely to be here, and I will email you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Got to dash tiff. Wine is calling. Lisa, my baby, it's calling me too. It is 12 minutes past four, which is quite a lot earlier than I usually start drinking, but hey, the internet didn't fail, so that's something to celebrate. Wendy, I Thank do you. hope you on social media. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Rafael. Thanks for all the good questions. Taryn Giebelman, I'm sending you kisses. <laughs> and now we are down to the nine diehards. And Any questions? Thank you very much. Have a glorious weekend, Tiffany. Thanks, and uh, hiding in the corner, Daniel. <laughs> Bye, Peter. Thanks, Tiffany. I've got to teach. So okay. Thanks for coming. Amazing. Sorry I was late. I had a coaching client and she ran half an hour over. So, but no problem. Thanks, thanks for so being much. Here. Bye. Thanks. Bye. How would I promote travel ebooks from scratch? Dear God, Kerry, I don't know. Pop me an email. Let's talk about it. No charge. Pop me a mail. Four of us left. Me, Daniel, Kathy, and Kerry. Bye, Kathy. Enjoy your beer. There's my daughter. Hello, Millie. <laughs> cool. I'm out. Cheers, chaps. <laughs>